And today I would like to talk to you about research road mapping with discourse graphs. As Eugene said, I, my name is Carla Kirsnell. I'm the network research team lead at Protocol Labs. And at PL, we build tools to move science forward faster. And we think that these tools are important public goods. And today I'd like to talk about one of those tools, the discourse graph, which we see as a protocol for sharing and synthesizing knowledge. And how we use it in research road mapping, which we see as a process for aligning incentives and managing information flows between researchers and research funders. Oh, this works. This is awesome. Great. So discourse graphs, a protocol for scientific coordination. What we mean by that is there's, there's been a lot of really interesting work uh, being done in the road mapping space. A lot of it by, for instance, the Foresight Institute has done some really excellent work with their tech trees and maps map initiative. We had a really great talk about that a little bit earlier. And so I'd like to talk about a tool that we've been supporting at PL, which we think is a nice complement, a powerful support for road mapping efforts. We think that discourse graphs can be used to describe the present state of the knowledge frontier, find opportunities to move the frontier forward, to evaluate different research initiatives, and find leverage points in a research network. So we like to think of science as being a complex system with lots of moving parts. And we think the discourse graphs can give us a little bit of insight into those moving parts and allow us to see little points where we might be able to influence the system for maximum impact. And uh, the work I'm talking about today is largely the creation of some of our grantees, some of the people that we've had the privilege of working with. So people like Joelle Chan, who is a professor who studies creative knowledge work at the University of Maryland and the creator of this particular discourse graph protocol. And David Vargas, who is an independent developer who builds tools for thought. And Matt Akamatsu, who is a molecular biologist who expanded the discourse graph grammar, the discourse graph system, to meet the needs of modern experimental science. And then also, of course, the discourse graph community of practitioners who are researchers, scientists, thinkers who get together and do cool things like meet up in Hawaii and talk about image annotation and genetically engineering novel fungi. So these are the kinds of cool people that you get to work with if you're interested in discourse graphs. And as was mentioned, we, uh, Joelle and David were kind enough or foresighted enough to offer us an impact certificate for supporting this work, so I, I want to mention that. Um, but I'm talking my book here. I'm very incentive aligned here with this talk. And this was co-issued to me and Evan. So at some point, we will, of course, fight to the death over ownership of this impact certificate. I've been doing my push-ups, Evan. <laughs> so let me describe the discourse graph grammar before I get into how we use it in, in road mapping. What's really cool about discourse graphs is it's a very simple, very naturalistic system. And it replicates the parts of natural living conversations. Really, there's some vibrancy and dynamism in the protocol. So you might you will recognize all of the parts of the graph. It has pieces like questions, asking questions, making claims about the world, uh, adducing evidence to support those claims, and then referring to sources to uh, provenance that evidence that you've adduced in support of the claim. So of course. The darling of the internet forum, the source, I made it up, is not good enough for a discourse graph. And those are, oh, let me move back a second. So here we have the nodes of our discourse graph. Now let me talk about the edges of the graph. The relations between the nodes are the relationships between these different pieces of the discourse graph conversation. So evidence informs questions. And it can be used to, say, support or oppose a claim. So there's a charge there. Claims can support or oppose other claims. And new questions can be informed by existing claims. And this is interesting because it means that there's sort of a little bit of pre-adaptation for the generation of new questions. You may have a claim out there that's sort of in, in search of a question. And it hints at the modularity and composability of the system, that something that seems to be settled in one discourse graph system may invoke or stimulate new questions in a new or adjacent field in the new discourse graph system. A lot of interoperability. It's like playing with Legos, and it's really fun to build. A little bit more about the data model. 
if you think about a discourse graph system as a system of nodes, and indeed it could be expressed in a system of post-it notes, very simple. Question notes express an open research question. And claim notes synthesize observations. What that means is that they bring together a lot of different uh, things you've noticed about the world, and you generalize them into a claim about the world. Evidence notes, on the other hand, a little bit low in the hierarchy, they express a specific observation. So they carry with them a lot of context, a lot of specificity. And source notes contextualize those observation notes. So the build process when you're creating a discourse graph, you start with a set of questions and you collect observations to begin to, to address those questions. Now I should mention that those two steps are often reversed. In, in especially in empirical science. A lot of times we find that we make an observation about the world, we say, huh, and then we, that, that generates some questions. I think a lot of science is precipitated by, huh, more often than Eureka. So then we synthesize, we've made a bunch of observations, we synthesize them into claims about the world, and then we compose those claims into arguments and theories, and then we go off and we find new questions or hypotheses to test. And I think you'll find this is a very familiar recapitulation of the process of scientific inquiry. This is what you do, and we're just kind of breaking it up into parts and making them explicit and uh, you know, sort of describing them with pretty little boxes on a slide. So discourse graphs are a client agnostic protocol. They can be implemented in anything from like a cork board murder board to a Miro board. Um, I think some of the more popular implementations now are netbook notebooks like Athens, LogSeq, um, Obsidian, Rome, for instance, is probably the most mature ecosystem for working with discourse graphs, largely because that's where David Vargas, the open source developer that I mentioned earlier, has developed a powerful suite of extensions for implementing the discourse graph protocol, but it's spreading to a lot of different clients, and David has a project where he's going to make that spread uh, even faster. So I mentioned there's, a, there's some flexibility in the protocol. I, I spoke earlier about the biologist, Madoka Matsu, who's um, sort of adapting the discourse graph grammar for experimental science. All that really means is that he's changing the terminology that we use to describe the different nodes in the graph to better reflect what goes on when you're working at the bench. So the original discourse graph protocol was um, developed from the needs of literature synthesis sort of examining and dealing with the needs of uh, the current knowledge frontier, assessing the state of the current state of the art, the current body of knowledge in a particular field. Results graphs, which is sort of Matt's twist on the subject, it's a little bit more geared toward experimental science. So the question, claim, and evidence ba uh, backed up by the source of the discourse graph in the result graph is hypothesis, conclusion, result, uh, and the source of truth there is the experiment or the model or the simulation. A slight difference, but it has particular implications. What it does is it emphasizes that the source of evidence in the results graph system is the experiment model or simulation, and it makes it very clear that a hypothesis is a request for experiments, and it's a system that makes it easier to formulate well-structured requests for experiments, and we'll see how that works when you incorporate this into the road mapping system. Okay, so I've said roadmap, I've invoked the term road mapping, but I haven't really defined my terms and it's sort of like I'm burying the lead here. What I mean by our research roadmap, it's a goal-centered model, essentially centered on a breakthrough innovation. It describes significant milestones in a technological effort and the relationships between those milestones. It is meant to concentrate expert attention on a research problem. Um, it identifies leverage points, as I mentioned, in the research, si in the research system. It surfaces them, sometimes ser serendipitously, um, for expert attention. And it allows us to drive distributed coordination around a problem. It sort of makes everybody, it gives a shared context for attacking a problem, for examining a problem, evaluating it. I would say that a discourse graph is a user interface for distributed coordination. It works well with the road mapping system. It helps us to understand the current state of the knowledge frontier, that's the synthesis process, to identify dependencies and missing links between milestones, and to create requests for experiments to incentivize distributed pathfinding. 
So the process where um, different distributed decentralized researchers can follow their own local incentives while keeping in mind global incentives, global state, and the global optimum of the system. And so I'm going to describe how this works in the context of, um, as an example, an RFP. In, in fact, an RFP that was developed and funded by the CryptoNet Lab at Protocol Labs uh, last cycle. I'm um, just using this as an example. This, this roadmap was derived from the RFP. The RFP was not developed explicitly as a roadmap, but I think it's a good illustration of how, because an RFP is a goal-centered research initiative, it can be represented as a roadmap. And so I'm using this example here. Um, any, any errors in the diagram are solely my own fault, and I apologize in advance to CryptoNet Lab. So the first step of building a research roadmap is to define the goal state and its properties. Ooh, I have a laser pointer. I think any time you get a laser pointer, you should also have like a conference cat. You can just kind of, it's awesome. So you define what, what is your definition of success? How does the world look different or better when you're done? Um, in this case, CryptoNet Lab wanted better vector commitments. And then they define the properties that constitute what is a better vector commitment. And those you can see in the purple uh, sort of squares outside of the green triangle, the goal state. Then you draft open problems for creating the necessary properties. And those can be kind of thought of as research projects um, that are ne necessary that you've defined to address the, the properties that your, your future state needs to have. And then you might, if you're particularly kind, suggest potential directions for solving the open problems. So these are, uh, these are ways that you might address, or ways you might approach the open problems um, that your, the, the, your grantees may make some mention of in their grant application. Here you can see each roadmap node in the RFP generation process can be seen as being supported by a discourse graph. And this is where that composability comes in. You can just sort of drop in a discourse graph at any one of these nodes to support your reasoning um, as you're building this graph. Uh, for instance, what is the desirable goal state? This is meant to represent an argument or a conversation that you may have internally as you're building, as you're building out your roadmap. Uh, what are the essential properties of the goal state? Another argument. What research projects are necessary to enable those properties? And what are the highest impact directions to take within each research project? These are, these are opinionated um, roadmaps. They express your beliefs about uh, the, the path to progress here, and so they should be supported with some evidence. And then finally, these are all synthesized into a roadmap, and you make the crucial distinction of which properties or projects should be deprioritized. And I'll get, I'll get into, uh, in a minute or two, actually just one minute, how we, how we might do that with discourse graphs. Again, an open problem statement is a request for experiments. So while you were shifting now from the internal discourse graph-like project of creating the roadmap, that you may do with a, a small circle of collaborators, and externalizing the problem. You're inviting people to the conversation by um, asking them to contribute results graphs for, to solve the problems identified whoops, in these nodes. Oh, the nodes are still here. And now I'm going to describe something. I'm going to pull out what's called the evidence drawer. It's not very, very uh, easy to see in this slide, so I'm going to go to the next slide. It's already it's been implemented in software in a couple of different client softwares, but this is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, in a little Miro board. What it does is it's a querying tool that David built, which allows you to attach attributes to any one of the nodes in your discourse graph. So for instance, when you're building uh, a roadmap, those appropriate attributes might be the robustness or of, of your, your confidence in a particular direction, the amount of support, the amount of evidence in support of going in that direction, the amount of evidence opposing going in that direction, and even whether there are, at the lower level, whether there are sources that support or oppose a particular, um, or support or contradict a particular piece of evidence. Now, if you're doing this collaboratively, it may be appropriate to describe those uh, bits of evidence, those attributes, as distributions which essentially could represent crowdsourced credences about the true value of whatever, whatever attributes you, you decide to attach to your discourse graph. There's a lot of flexibility here in the different implementations. And essentially what you're doing is you're building an investment thesis. Um, we're seeing here not only can roadmaps be used to um, drive what we call like an RFP project, but also there's meta-roadmapping where you may 
roadmap the process to drive adoption of a research for public good that's sort of at a different scale. So these, road, these discourse graphs are kind of scale independent. And essentially, each one of these graphs represents an investment thesis for the for the direction that you want to ex the direction that you want to uh, support, incentivize, accelerate, and so we can see that there's a little bit of similarity and complementarity in the way that we build discourse graphs and the way we build research roadmaps. We start with a set of questions. We start working with the current knowledge frontier, synthesize claims about its position, locate gaps in the frontier, estimate how important it is to fill those gaps in a comparative way request experiments um, to fill the gaps, collect conclusions, resynthesize all of our data, and push the frontier forward, and then start with new and better questions. And I think I'm going to be contractually obligated to show this particular slide, crossing the innovation chasm. Um, we are missing effective coordination systems to make this part happen. Juan has mentioned this several times. I think I'm going to cheekily drop in the results graph protocol. It is a, a small but significant contribution to the types of coordination systems that we'd like to see built to move science forward and to coordinate activity around a research goal. If uh, you're interested in these types of problems and building research portfolios and talking about research road mapping, we have open positions in the network research team. That's my team, research program managers. That's my role, research scientists. Uh, research startup operators. We also have a Discord for network goods, public goods nerds. Um, if you haven't joined it already, please do join us there and nerd out with us. And uh, Joelle and Matt and the Discourse Graph community of practitioners, really awesome people. They are, they are in our Discord. They have their own Discord. They're all over the place. If you want to read the docs um, and read more about Discourse Graphs at your leisure, um, there's a really nice wiki that uh, Joelle has put together. And I should mention Matt Akamatsu, if you want to work with results graphs more closely, Matt Akamatsu is hiring a librarian, which is an even cooler form of librarian to help work with the, with the results graph um, syntax, results graph grammar, protocol, and community. And thank you very much. <laughs>